Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got an extremely interesting guest. We've got management on with us today, but he's a super cool guy. And a, he's had a, we're with Barry Bergman. He's got a great career, uh, very interesting guy, uh, very successful, and he's going to open our eyes and ears to a lot of the things behind the scenes. Uh, quick announcement, I want to thank our mutual friend, Mark Ribbler. Mark, thank you for connecting us. And also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube already, hit the subscribe button and that little icon that looks like a bell that helps us with the YouTube algorithm. And thank you. All righty, Barry, former vice president of creative affairs for United Artists Music. As part of Edward B. Marks Music Corporation, he also played a key role in launching the careers of ACDC, Meatloaf, John Paul Young, and Flash in the Pan while he was vice president and professional manager there. He formed Barry Bergman Management, representing recording artists and a publishing company representing songwriters. He's published over 400 songs recorded by artists, including Cher, Michael Bolton, Joan Jett, Kiss, and others. Some top hits include Don't Shed a Tear, which was recorded by Paul Carrick. Don't Close Your Eyes, recorded by Kix and Kathy Matea's Love Travels. He's also founder and chairman emeritus of the Music Managers Forum US, which is an international not-for-profit organization with over a thousand members worldwide. He's an outspoken advocate on artist rights and has testified on Capitol Hill serving the interests of artists. And he was inducted into the Personal Managers Hall of Fame on May 10th, 2018. He currently holds music industry seminars focusing on management, marketing, music publishing, and promotion. And uh, as he says, this business is about earning a sustainable living, doing what you love with people you enjoy. And he's also a super cool guy just to talk to. Really interesting. So Barry, thanks for coming on the show, man. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, so as a kid, you were fascinated with music. You graduated from uh, NYU and you tried to get a job in the music industry, but were unable to. Instead, you became a stockbroker. And then while you were working as a stockbroker, you started a record production and publishing company signing artists and songwriters. Mike, I was curious, what about that business was, what about this business was so appealing to you? And, and how did you just like get, how did you know how the business worked in the beginning and how did, how did you convince people to come on board with you without the same track record as maybe other people had brand new? Well, <clears throat> it all started out for me when I was about, uh, 10, 11 years old, when my father took me to the first Alan Freed rock and roll show at the uh, Brooklyn Paramount. And I looked up at the stage and I was mesmerized because music is what got me through all the early years. I used to, you know, go to school and come home and listen to my 45s, many of which I still have. And, uh, when I went to that show, it, uh, it was life changing. It was one of those moments where I looked up at the stage and I said, one of the, this is what I want to do with my life. One of these days, I'm going to have somebody up there myself. And uh, I think that's what really was the, uh, the launching pad for it all. And I think, uh, and, and also I, I should say that uh, at uh, it wasn't based. Uh, it, it wasn't based on things that I would uh, say were right at the time, because I was a picked on kid, a bullied kid, and I really believed. Uh, I guess uh, you know, I believed that. Wow, I'll get close to artists. All my problems will go away. Interesting. And, and uh, you know, I found shortly thereafter that uh, nothing goes away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you work on yourself and things go away. There you go, man. Not that you get close to artists or, or songwriters or anyone else. But uh, that was what the motivating, uh, the motivation was early on, which was totally wrong. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I was a fan. And I think one of the reasons uh, I've been, you know, good at what I've done over the years uh, is the fact that I don't do it. I don't write, I don't sing, I don't play, I don't produce. Uh, you know, so I'm a fan. So when I listen to a record, unlike most people, I listen to the whole track or the whole right. album. 
I don't listen to the guitars because I'm a guitar player. I don't listen to the vocals because I sing. I listen to the whole record, including lyrics. Right. And uh, I find that most people in this industry uh, are frustrated uh, whatever, you know, whether it be, you know, uh, guitar players, drummers, uh, vocalists, artists, songwriters, uh, you know, that for whatever reason never made it and they went to something else. But they're always listening in terms of what they would do. Right. I don't do it. So I can be objective. Right. I don't say, wow, this is not good because I could do better. Yeah. So you're agendaless in a sense. Yes. I'm a, and, I, and I'm agnostic as far as, uh, you know, uh, the genre of music or, you know, you know, this music that I like versus music that I don't like. But when I listen to things, I listen to the overall, you know, uh, the overall, you know, track. I try to take in the whole thing. So you were working as a stockbroker and basically you, you emotionally that business or that job was probably not satisfying. You said, Hey, let me start a publishing company or management company on the side. I hated, I hated every minute of it. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, the only reason why I became a stockbroker was because I was banging on doors to try to get into the music business. Couldn't get a job anywhere in the business. So I said, if I got to be miserable, let me try to make some money. Sure. I sure. figured the money's down on Wall Street. Right. So, uh, you know, I told my family at the time that I was going to go to Wall Street. And they said, Wall Street? What do you know about stocks and bonds? I said, nothing. I'll learn. <laughs> right. I said, I'll learn. And I went out there, banged on doors. And I met this uh, woman, uh, Anna Mae Colby. She were at a company called Steiner Rouse and Company. She was giving the training program. And I told her, you know, that I wanted to become a broker and, you know, take the course, go into the training program, take the course and get my license. And I figured I'd be down there for a year, two years, and that would be it. So she says to me, she said, you know, I, after interviewing me, she said, you know, I really would love to hire you, but I don't make that decision. So I said, who does? So she said, Eddie Mirabella, the senior partner of the firm, he does the hiring. So I said, can I please speak to him? I'd like to meet him. And she said to me, uh, unfortunately, you can't. I said, why? She said, he's in the hospital right now. He's uh, having some elective surgery in the next day or two. So I said, I'm sorry to hear that. So I said, I appreciate it, and I'll uh, be in touch. I went home. And I picked up what we call the phone book in those days, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, uh, it's all, it seems like an artifact at this point, doesn't yes, it? It's yes. so funny to hear you say that. Yeah. It's historical. <laughs> it uh, I, I, I picked up a phone book. I called every hospital in New York city until, Oh I my God. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> I finally got him on the phone. <laughs> and the first thing I said to him was, Mr. Mirabella, because here I am, a young kid. He's an older guy. I said, Mr. Mirabella, my name is Barry Bergman. I was in to see Anna Mae Colby today at, the, at your firm. She did not tell me you were here. He, he said, really? I said, no, she did not tell me you were here. She told me you were in a hospital uh, because I asked to meet you because I wanted to get into the training program. And... Uh, I decided I'll go home and call every hospital until I find you. This is hilarious. I did. And he said to me, Barry, if you would do that, I'm hiring you right now. Yeah. He said, uh, I'm calling her the first thing in the morning and you'll start in two weeks. That's so cool. Yeah, because if you're willing to do that, you, and if you do the same thing on the phone with calling, exactly. yeah. Because you're always prospecting for right. new accounts. Yeah. You know, to get new clients for stocks and bonds and whatnot. So, uh, <laughs> into the training program. It's hilarious, man. This is. <laughs> Life is hilarious. You know? <laughs> so, so I, I ended up in the training program, got my license, and what I thought would be a year ended up seven years. Wow. You know? So you must have liked a little bit to stay that long. No, I didn't like it. I, in fact, I 
you know, disliked it immensely. You know, uh, I did very, very well there, mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't like the people. I didn't like, uh, you know, the nature of how uh, rigid it was. And uh, I used to come in dressed a little more casual than most people. And uh, one of the partners at uh, the firm I was in says, I, I was in five firms in seven years because they were falling apart. Mm. So I kept leaving. But uh, one of the firms that I was in, uh, one of the managers at the office said to me, you know, look at the way you dress. What do you think? You're in show business? <laughs> and I said to him, no, I don't think I'm in show business, but that's where I'm heading. Yeah, that's cool. You know, and uh, that was my uh, Wall Street days. So you always had it in your mind that you were going to be in music. You just didn't know the right. I made up my mind at that Alan Freed show at 10, 11 years old. This is where I was going to be. The only problem was nobody told me it would take 20 years to get into it full time. You know, uh, you know, life, uh, you know, it unfolded, but in time. When I make up my mind that I'm going to do something, I do it. Right, right. You know, I'm, uh, I'm into the challenge, and I will do it. Think, when you do that, have you found out that things never happen in your time frame? Uh, I have found out that you can't have a time frame. Right. Because uh, you're only setting yourself up for disappointment. Yeah, very true. Like when I, I tell people even, uh, you know, in the industry over the years, I've said to people, uh, uh, if you got a plan B, go right to it. <laughs> Don't waste your time. Right, right. Yeah, that you makes know? sense. So did you start your firm first or did you go to work for Edward B. Marks? No, I thought what ended up happening is I started uh, working at Edward B. Marks. I got in there. And uh, th that was a long story. That's a story, if you'd like to hear some of it. I, Your call. Okay. I, uh, I had a very dear friend, and uh, we were, you know, best friends. And, we, and I was in this little production company with him. And he was a uh, successful songwriter at the time. But prior, he had a big hit. And... Uh, uh, and he was gonna, he was aspiring to be a producer mm -hmm. and I was gonna run the business, you know. Uh, okay. You know, get the acts and uh, do the promotion, marketing and everything else. And uh, we started this little firm, you know, I started this little, little production company and I was funding it with my Wall Street money. Right. And, uh, and what ended up happening is, uh, you know, we put out some records and, uh, I, you know, uh, I would get in the car and I'd go uh, from uh, New York to uh, Richmond, Virginia, Baltimore, Washington, you know, all the way up to Richmond. And then I go the other way up to Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And I actually started doing that in the early 60s. To meet with like radio stations? Is that what you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Doors after we made the records. So you just you you've been adorned. You have you always known that you make relationships person to person, say hello, and that you got, and you don't have a problem knocking on doors, which is great. No, I don't have a problem with door slamming in my face either. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, because I don't personalize it because they don't know me. Of course, yeah. How am I going to personalize it? You know, this is an industry. If you want to be in it. You got to be willing to be rejected, dejected, ejected, and everything else. Otherwise, you cannot be successful in this business. Yeah. Because things are not always going to go your way. As Fleetwood Mac has saying, uh, go your own way. Yeah. They don't always go your own way. Sure. But uh, so I would, uh, you know, but I actually started in 62 before that production company when I teamed up with. Richie Cordell, who I found, mm -hmm. and Richie Cordell was a, an absolutely uh, uh, vastly talented guy. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he was a, a tremendous druggie, big druggie. And uh, I, uh, you know, he was a big druggie and I had no affinity to drugs. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and I, you know, thought at the time I was going to change him and he thought he was going to change me. But we made some records 
and uh, we, uh, you know, I worked the hell out of those records, got them on the air in places. In fact, uh, one of the first people that ever played one of my records was a fellow by the name of Joey Reynolds, who's still in my life, from WKBW in Buffalo. That's wild. Yeah, he's, uh, I just spoke to him yesterday. So uh, he, was one of, and he was one of the only guys at the station that could play his own music because he was like the number one guy in the country. And uh, we've been friendly ever since 62. You know, we've, uh, we've stayed in each other's lives. Is that how you had to get music on in general back then? You had to go and like knock on doors and say, hey, here's well, like, like a sales pitch. You know, you had to knock on doors. You had to get lucky if you could get some help. But there were, you know, other things going on also that, uh, you know, you know, were probably not up for discussion. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I was very fortunate. Yeah. I, I made some friends and uh, I got help and I was able to find out if I had anything. Right. You know, if my records had anything. So I, you know, Richie Cordell, he and I uh, worked together for about four or five years. That ended. And uh, six months after it ended, and I knew he was vastly talented, he had, uh, I don't know, about 20 hits. Holy crap. <laughs> uh, as a writer and a producer, he, he wrote and produced all the Tommy James and the Shondell hits. Okay. He wrote Moni Moni, I think We're Alone Now. Oh my God, wow. Uh, uh, so, uh, and he produced uh, those Tommy James uh, and Shondell hits, and he did Alive and Kicking, Tighter and Tighter, and uh, you know, all sorts of those big songs, yeah. So, at least I knew I picked a good one, I found right, one, right, even though it didn't work out, sure, you know. And uh, so, then later on, like I said, I started this production company with this friend of mine, and uh. In 1974, he got a job at Edward B. Mark's Music. So okay. I figured, wow, now's my time. I'm going to get in. Finally, right. I get it. He didn't want to bring me in. <laughs> what happened? He was financing our production company. Uh, he was my best friend. You know, uh, we were business together for a bunch of years. Well, I th what happened was uh, he was very insecure about what was going to be, felt threatened by me in some way. And I guess I was as insecure as anyone else was. Sure. But uh, at the time. So uh, he got in, and a year later he heard that I was going to probably move to L.A. Uh, <clears throat> I had said that to a few people that I was considering it. Mm -hmm. Not that it ever happened, because I've never left New York. Right. But, uh, when he heard I might go to L.A., he panicked. He got me an interview up there, and I got hired. So 1975, I was full-time at Edward B. Mark's Music. What did full-time doing what? Uh, my job, I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, vice president. I became a vice president professional manager. And, uh, you know, basically I was bringing, um, my concept was to, was to bring acts in. Mm -hmm. not just pitch songs because my thing was that I felt if you controlled the act, you would have every song on the album. So yeah, sure. Labels couldn't make a mistake, you know, where you were concerned, whatever so a track they picked to promote would be yours. Would be Correct. Yeah. So Teddy was, uh, uh, you know, my friend at the time, he was going to, uh, he wanted to produce and I, uh, you know, uh, you know, wanted to, you know, bring in singer-songwriters and bands and, you know, develop them and, you know, break them, make them happen. Mm. But I, I, I guess we were each on separate pages, different pages, because I went out and I, uh, I, I found, uh, I got ACDC, I found that band. How the hell did you do that? Well, it's not that I found them, per se. Uh, we had relationships with with Jay Albertson Company over in Australia, and they had controlled the band. And I had uh, seen some videos of the act, and we had some sort of a reciprocal relationship. So okay. I, the, the Jay Albertson said, I really want it. I really want it. I got to have it. And we got it. Yeah. 
Wow. So where did, okay. So spend a minute on this. Uh, Cause it's pretty interesting. You, you meet ACDC or you see them and then th this company, Australia, basically assigns U.S. management rights over to you. Not management rights. No, we were the publisher. Okay. So they signed uh, publishing uh, rights they, over to you. They signed the publishing right. Not they signed it over. There was a reciprocal agreement okay. that Mark's Music had with Jay Alberts. Uh, you know, uh, when Mark's Music uh, was like a sub-publisher and got a, a fee for, uh, for services, uh, for whatever the music generated. Right. And... Uh, and basically, uh, and, I, and I'm going to segue forward for a minute and say that there was another act that was brought to my attention that I went to see that blew me away, that I said I have to have, and that was Meatloaf. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, that was the bat out of hell. The wow. Original. And, uh, you know, he opened his mouth. I said, I'm getting this. I got to go after this. And uh, I was amazed how nobody wanted him. It was pretty amazing. So like when you reached out to him, he was nobody else. You're the only guy that happened to reach out to him or? Well, I reached out to the management and to him uh, and said that we wanted to sign him at Mark's Music. Yes. And, you know, and Mark's Music was a re, re, like was a reputable company. company. Yeah. No, yeah. But it was they, an old line. It was an old line music publishing company, family run that went back to 1894. They had okay. all the Billy Holiday stuff. They had South, all the Latin American, South American stuff. Uh, 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 Ernesto Laquona, uh, Ernesto Laquona. They had more. The theme from Mondo Cani. They had Terry Jack Seasons in the Sun. Oh wow! You know they yeah. had they had loads of stuff over the years. Right. You know, loads of stuff. They were very reputable. They were one of the first three publishers uh, to become a member of BMI. Okay when BMI first began. And uh, it was, uh, you know, so I had Meatloaf. We ended up signing Meatloaf. And I had uh, ACDC. And I was like a, surrog a, a surrogate manager to ACDC because the manager, the original manager at the time, Michael Browning, he couldn't always be in America. Mm -hmm. You know, they were an Australian band. Uh, and... Uh, I had an incredible, incredible relationship with them. It was absolutely amazing. We were so different, yet for some reason the chemistry was unbelievably great. Tell me uh, some funny or interesting stories about your experience with those guys. <coughs> okay. Well, they were, uh, you know, on Atlantic Records. They were coming into town one day, and I got a call from... Uh, you know, the guy who handled the press over at Atlantic at the time, Perry Cooper. And uh, he said, Barry, the guys are coming in this weekend. Uh, we should do something with them. I said, absolutely. So he said, you know what? I'll get a boat. I'll, I'll uh, borrow my friend's boat. <laughs> and we'll take them out on a boat ride up the uh, east, up the, uh, you know, the west side and the east side. So uh, I said, great, let's do that. So the guys came in, and Perry got the boat, and we went up the boat. Uh, we, we were uh, going up the, uh, the west side and the east side, and I was navigating the boat, captain of the boat. And coming back, everybody was on the upper deck at the time. The guys were on the upper deck playing some sort of board game and uh, with the manager, and there was another invited guest or two. And uh, all of a sudden, I hit rocks. You couldn't oh. see him. And everybody fell. And uh, Angus gave out a scream. What are you trying to do, kill me? <laughs> so uh, I said, no, 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 rocks. And there were no cell phones back then. Sure. So we're flailing our hands, you know, for help until somebody uh, gets the Coast Guard to tow us in. Holy smokes. You know, and we finally get towed in. And I don't want to, uh, you know, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, what should I call it? Uh, discuss the incident when I go up to Atlantic Records the following week, right, right? You know, but and nobody brings it up to me or anything else. But uh, <clears throat> three, four months later, five months later, when I was up there, I. Uh, 
I happened to say to Perry Cooper, I said, Perry, by the way, whatever happened with the boat? I know, uh, I know we had problems and it was a borrowed boat. Whatever happened? He said, well, Barry, I'll tell you what happened. He said, <laughs> he said we had $10,000 worth of damage. Wow. And that was in 1978. Yeah, that's like probably $40,000 worth of damage today, right? So I said, what happened? He said, well, I spoke to Jerry. He was the head of the company at the time. And we called up Russ Solomon at Tower Records. He was the head of Tower Records. And uh, we sent down 10,000 cleans. In other words, uh, we got the boat fixed and we sold Russ Solomon for cash 10,000 albums. <laughs> Clean albums at a cheap price. Okay. And that's how they paid for the boat. Oh, okay, okay. So he, all right, I got you. Wow. So here I am. Uh, this goes back two years ago. I still have a relationship with, uh, with, with this band. Uh, and not that, they're, you know, they're, it's basically over now. Mm -hmm. I, I, if it comes back, it'll be in some other configuration because we've lost Malcolm. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Phyllis had issues, the drummer, and uh, this, uh, well, it's, you know, there's been other issues. So I was with, uh, you know, I was with Angus two years ago. You know, uh, I went to see the show they played at Madison Square Garden. And I was, I felt very blessed because I went back, I, I went uh, to the press room after with everybody. I had tickets for the press room. And uh, I was with uh, a very dear friend of mine who was a fan that I took to see the show, uh, my friend Joshua. And I also uh, met there you know, Arno, uh, Arno uh, Durier and his wife. He was the author of one of the ACDC books. Okay. Uh, no book has ever been authorized. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no book, because the band does not do that. Right. And, uh, you know, Arno said there's a big tall guy back, back there that's walking around in the room. There's 150 people in the press room. Hmm. You know, and there, you know, there's alcohol there and hors d'oeuvres and whatever. And there's this big guy, and Arno says, I know him. He works with the band. So he calls him over, <coughs> and he says, Tim, I want you to meet my friend Barry Bergman. He worked with the band early on, and he would love to see Angus. And uh, Tim turns around and says, uh, look around this room, Arno. Everybody wants to see Angus. Right. Uh, so, uh, to make a long story short, uh, uh, I said to him, I pulled out a business card, and I said, Tim, do me a favor. If you can get the, this card to Angus, I would have greatly appreciate it. If he wants to see me, fantastic. If he doesn't want to see me, it's also fantastic. Right. I understand. He said, Barry, I doubt it's going to happen because he doesn't see anybody. Those days are over. So I said, fine, not a problem. So uh, we're walking around the room, mixing and talking to people. The Sony people were there, you know, all, all the executives and other people were there that were interested in the band that had, you know, press passes. And 20 minutes later, we're walking around. Uh, this big guy, uh, Tim, walks back into the room and he's looking around the room. He yells out, Barry Bergman? And I, and I wave my hand right here. And he says, come this way. And I'm walking with my friend Josh and I'm walking with Arnold and his wife. He said, uh, hey guys, I just want to tell you, Angus said he wants to see Barry and nobody else. So, you know, uh, we're going to take Barry back. You guys wait here. All right. That's cool, man. So I went back to, uh, you know, uh, I had uh, some sumo wrestlers uh, walk me back. Right. You know, and I walked in the, in his dressing room there, and there was two people sitting in there doing some, uh, obviously, some paperwork. And he came running over to me with the hug of all hugs, with uh, tears in his eyes. Oh, that's cool. Uh, and he said, Barry, how have you been doing? How's your health? How are you feeling? How's this? How's that? Tell me what's been going on, and da 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 da, and I uh, and I said to to him, we sat down and we talked, 
and while we're talking, uh, the door, uh, the, the door. So there's a knock on the door, and they open up, and they and they said, uh, "Kara is here, and so and so is here for you." Uh, he says, uh, "Tell him I'm busy. I'll be out soon. Tell him I'm busy." So I said, uh, "I said, fine. I appreciate the time, Angus." So uh, you know, we talked, and then I said to him, "Boy, we have a lot of history." He said, "We sure do." Uh, and uh, and he said, so what are you doing now? So I said, well, I'm doing seminars, and I'm uh, doing consulting. So he says to me, you're going to do very, very well with your seminars so uh, and your consulting. He said, I said, Angus, I said, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. I said, but how can you say that? What are you basing it on? And he looks at me, and he said, Barry, Look at the advice you gave us and what happened. What was? I said, I appreciate that. He said, you sure told me the right things. Right. So he said, I have every reason to believe you're going to tell others the right things to do. What was one thing maybe that you had advised them on that pa paid off or panned out? Okay. Well, I'm, uh, I still want to finish something there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want to segue back. Sure. So I said to him, we have a lot of history. He said, we sure do. I says, you remember the boat outing we had? <laughs> back to the boat. So that's why I wanted to seg back, you know. So he said, can I, do I remember the boat? How can I forget the boat? He said, you almost killed me. I said, I thought I was going to fall down a whole flight of stairs there. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I was a little concerned, you know. And I said, afterwards, I was very concerned, you know, with the damage we had with the boat. And he looks at me and he says, Barry, you never had anything to worry about. I said, why? I said, why do you say that? He said, we had a band meeting that night to, and we discussed the whole boat thing. And we were going to swear that you didn't have anything to do with the problem. <laughs> very cool. You know, that we don't know how it happened, but, uh, you know, he, he had nothing to do with it. Right, right. I said, I appreciate that. That's cool. But and now you said, what, what was some one of the things that I told him that panned out? Yeah. Well, I told him the following. You know, early on, they never had, uh, radio did not want to play any of their music. The album rock stations, a lot of them did not want to play the music. And I understood why. You know, they really didn't have a magic song. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of what goes on in this life is based on a magic song. Interesting. So I said to him, he said, Barry, radio doesn't want to play our music. And I don't know what we're going to do. So I said to him, Angus, here's what you're going to have to do. You and the band just have to get up every day, do what you're doing, and the pendulum is going to swing. I said, don't worry about the, uh, you know, radio. It'll come. Just get out there and build that following like you're doing. I said, you got a live show that nobody can beat. I said, just do your thing. I said, don't worry about radio. It'll come. And it sure did. How did you know <laughs> that, that would happen? Because... You know, I'll tell you something. Certain people are just born to be in certain businesses. These guys were born to be in this industry. These guys were road rats. They played and played and played and played and played. And uh, they uh, were very, very only concerned about the fans they weren't concerned about becoming God knows who. What got them off was when they wowed an audience. Right. They didn't even want industry in the front rows. They wanted fans. Right. You know, and these guys, you know, were, uh, they, you know, when you're born to do something, something's going to happen. It's that simple. Right. You know, this is not an industry for hobbyists. Even though a lot of people, you know, uh, are doing things in this business part-time. Sure. I've never seen a part-timer make it big time. 
Well, that goes back to what you said a few minutes ago. You, if, if you, you told people, if you have a plan B, you execute it go now. Right through it. Go yeah, right yeah. Through it. Yeah. But, That's cool. Uh, you know, I had uh, these guys were just amazing. They had a work ethic unlike anybody I've ever seen. And I felt they were beautiful human beings. And I can't tell you how, you know, uh, honored I was to be able to work with them. It was a great experience. And That's I, cool. you know, I, uh, things happened that I could have never thought in a million years. I ended up in one of their CDs. They put me in the booklet, which I have here. This one, Let There Be Rock. Great record. That's yeah. one of my favorite ACDs here. Arnold uh, worked on this, and uh, they used the picture. Here we are. I got them the key to the city of North Miami with the mayor. That's so cool. Yeah, they're getting the key to the city. That's awesome, man. You know, and uh, it was, uh, you know, also there was an alive, uh, they, they did a live at the Atlantic Studio album. You know, Atlantic Records had the, started the series live at the Atlantic Studios to keep the bands out there, and they would just do a thousand copies promotional mm -hmm. for radio. And they did one with ACDC, which we did at the huge Atlantic Studios that was uh, in, uh, up uh, near Central Park. And there was three, four hundred people at that uh, live show in the studio. And in the middle of singing The Jack, uh, Bon Scott is looking all over the place. You know, nobody knows what he's looking for. And all of a sudden, he's pushing people away. I was sitting upstairs. You know, they put up like, you know, uh, stadium seating. Right. And uh, he pushes everybody away and he comes running over to me shoves the mic in my mouth and says, sing it, Barry. <laughs> and I'm singing the Jack with him. That's so funny. At one point. And after it was done, Angus and Malcolm said, that's the take we're going to use. That's we're so funny. Barry famous. And I'm on it. Yeah, I'm on it's the hilarious. Record. You know? In fact, I want to show you something also. Yeah, go ahead. Do it. Here. In fact, when I... Saw Angus, well, you know, two, uh, like I said, two years ago, you know, so I had spent, uh, you know, I want to go back to that for a minute since we're talking about him. Uh, I had spent, you know, I was with him, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, and I had told you there was a knock on the door and this, that, and the next thing. And, uh, you know, I said to him after 20 minutes, because, you know, I didn't know he's busy, whatever, after the show, whatever. I said, you know, you got some people outside that are waiting for you. And I, you know, I'll get out of your way so we can, uh, you can uh, see them or do whatever you have to do. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to go. He said, you just stay right here. That's my family. I want you to meet them. Oh, that's cool. So he called, he, he sent out for them to come in and I, he introduced me to his wife and to his, uh, you know, to Malcolm's daughter and his uh, niece, uh, Malcolm's daughter, his niece and the kids and her husband and everything else. And I ended up sitting there with them, uh, you know, over an hour. That's cool, uh, man. With, uh, and, and, you know, he, you know, I spoke with them for a short while. And uh, the, wife, the wife said, uh, when did you, uh, how long do you know uh, Angus? Uh, and Angus says to her before I, you know, he even gave me a chance to answer. He said, we met Barry with the minute we came to America. And, uh, and then he said something I wish I had a tape recording of. He said, if it wasn't for Barry, we wouldn't have become successful. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, and before we left, he said, how about we do a picture? I saw that on your website, yeah. Yeah, well, there it is, so everyone can see it. Very cool, man. That is cool. You know, and I had said to him also, I said, so what's the plan now before we left? I said, what do you... Uh, what, what's going to be now? Because, you know, uh, that, that was before Malcolm passed away and, uh, you know, and everything, you know, came to a screeching halt. But uh, I said, so, I, and, and Cliff, who I was very close to, Cliff Williams, the bass player, I said to him, uh, uh, Cliff wasn't there that night. He left right afterwards. His mother was in town. Mm. 
uh, so I said to Angus, so what's the plan? If Cliff is retiring, uh, you know, Malcolm's not in the band, this is not this, that. He says, I don't know what the plan is. He sa so I says, do you have any idea what you want to do with your life? And I couldn't believe his answer. He said, Barry, he says, I don't know. He says, all I know how to do is play guitar and run around like an idiot. He says, that's all I know how to do. So, uh, you know, that was my adventures, my early adventures with them. But I've, you know, uh, I've had the relationship ongoing all through the years. That's, that's that the longest professional relationship you have? That's pretty long. Uh, yeah. In fact, I'll show you something else. I uh, got a visit one day that was very surprising. Uh, in fact, let me see where it is, if I can find it. Uh, I got a visit from Cliff right here, right behind me. Here. He right. Got the photos taken. And what, was that after that meeting with? Uh, no, this is uh, this was about ten years ago. Okay. Uh, Thirteen years ago. Yeah, well, you know, I I was out of touch for a while with them. And uh, I had dinner with a paparazzi friend of mine uh, by the name of Bob Bank. <clears throat> and uh, he said, you'll never guess what I'm doing in a couple of weeks. I said, what? Who am I going to see? He said, I'm covering a John Entwistle benefit. And he says, they have a, you know, a superstar band there. And he said, you'll never guess who's in it. I said, who? He says, two of the ACDCs, Brian Johnson and uh, Cliff Williams. <laughs> I said, oh, that's great. I said, say hello for me. Because I had been out of touch for a bunch of years, you know, mm. other own ways and this and that. Even though I said, said we've had this long-term relationship, which it, it, it's always come back. Sure. You know? But uh, so I don't think anything of it. But four weeks later, the phone rings on a Friday and who's on the phone? It's uh, it's uh, Brian Johnson. He he calls me and he, uh, I says hello. He says I said who's this? He said this is Brian Johnson from ACDC. I said who? He said Brian Johnson. I said who? <laughs> he said Barry. You don't know who I am? I said no. I know who you are. I said I was just trying to figure out if it wasn't a friend of mine calling up, putting on an accent. And, and playing games with me because this is what's happened over the years. Oh, you've had prank calls I've like had, that. I've had, I've had calls from friends and people who would, uh, you know, you know, imitate you or one of the other guys. Right. Whatever. So I said, no, I said, it's so great to hear from you. I said, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's fabulous. It's been a long time. He said, I know, I know. And I didn't know him as well as I knew the others because the others were sure. there from the beginning. Yeah. He came in later after Bond passed away. But uh, so he, uh, he said to me, yeah, Barry, a photographer came through here and, uh, you know, sent your regards. And my first thing I thought was I said to him, where do we find him? So he gave me your number. Right. So I figured I'm going to give you a call. He That's said, cool. Uh, he says, Cliff is here. Would you? He said, I'm sure you want to speak to him. I said, absolutely. So uh, he yells uh, over. He says, Cliff, there's a phone call. And Cliff yells, uh, take a message. He said, I can't take a message. Come and take the call. So I said, okay. He, sa he said, okay. He gets on the phone. And uh, I said, hey, Cliffy, how are you? He says, holy shit, is this Barry? I said, yeah, it's Barry. He said, where are you? I said, I'm in Manhattan, in New York City. He said, I'm off Tuesday. Can I come and see you? I said, of course. I said, where would you like to meet? He said, uh, give me the address. And I'll cool. meet you right at the address. And he came here and we, uh, you know, he came here and, you know, it was an unbelievable uh, reunion at the time. And, he, you know, he said some amazing things. 
you know, when he told me that, uh, you know, how blessed he was and everything else. You know, he had said something to the effect that, uh, you know, Barry, I haven't had anything to worry about in 25, 30 years. And uh, he said, I'm married to the most wonderful woman in the world. I've got uh, some fantastic kids, two fantastic kids. And he said, I'm in this, uh, you know, iconic band that blew up. And he said, uh, I came here today to say thank you. That's cool, man. You know, these guys, unlike their image and everything else, they are really terrific human beings. I don't think their image portrays them as not terrific human no, beings no, no. at well, all. They unlike their image. They're, you know, they're a real, like, crazy party band. Okay, yeah. You know, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, you think about, uh, you know, harder rock music and party bands and this and that. Uh, it's not that they have a, a negative image or they're demonic or something else, but uh, you would think that they're not, you know, the, the family type. Sure. You know, and they are. They're very, you know, into their roots, and they're, they don't forget. They've got memories like hawks. Yeah. Most musicians I find are pretty humble, to be honest with you. Okay. I mean, I've had like... 750 guests i'd say almost 90 you know over 95 percent of them are all pretty grateful well, especially right. nowadays because you know how hard it is to make a living in the music business so if they're still there doing it they're pretty grateful yeah but when you get the real superstars yeah i'm I, right? yeah the real superstars you know uh they forget quickly a lot of them yeah, yeah. a lot of them really do forget they don't acknowledge you know who was there at the beginning sure you know, uh, I'm not talking about, you know, there are some nice people. There's always going to be great, great uh, musicians. But with a lot of these bands and, and this, that, and the next thing, uh, you know, people forget things. Sure, sure. They forget their roots. When, okay, so eventually you, you left and went out on your own. Yeah, but before that also we had Meatloaf, I was telling you. Go ahead. You know, and uh, I thought he was absolutely amazing. You know, uh, there were, to me, there wasn't a bad song in that original album, Bad Out of Hell. Yeah, it was a great record. <laughs> it's a classic album. And uh, I, I'm probably, I have far, far exceeded, you know, my expectations because I would have never thought in a million years that I would have had, uh, you know, been involved with two acts that each had one of the biggest selling albums of all time of, in recorded music. Yeah. These two acts are both in the top five or six of the biggest selling albums of all time. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. Um, th you went out on your own. Yes, 19, uh, late 81. What made you do that? I'll tell you what made me do that. I went to work for United Artists Music Publishing. I signed a couple of acts there. I signed a fellow by the name of Rob Friedman and uh, a band by the name of Pictures with the lead singer of Bob Halligan Jr. And uh, the company uh, was not treating them properly a year and a half in wanted extensions on the agreement, which I uh, didn't think was fair when I asked, you know, uh, how, how, do, how do you want to compensate them for an extension? And he said, I want to give them nothing. We haven't really made anything yet. I said, well, it takes time to develop things. Sure. You know, so uh, what ended up happening is I defended the, uh, the acts and I ended up getting fired. And, uh, you know, I have a favorite saying, and that is the following, you know, 39 years ago, my greatest fear in life was not having a job and not having a paycheck. 39 years later today, my greatest fear in life is having to get a job. <laughs> you know, that's one of my favorite sayings. I hear you. But uh, I uh, went ahead and uh, 
I went ahead and I decided, you know, after I got fired, I said I was so down and I was very down about it all. Um, about the whole the whole music industry, your whole experience. The whole experience, that yeah. whole experience of getting fired. I said, it's never going to happen to me ever again. I'm going to just, you know, go do my own thing. And, and I, that's what uh, you did. I had a very dear friend who was, she encouraged me to just go out and do it. And uh, I just did it. And I just said, okay, I'm going to go do it. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I didn't know anything of how I would make anything happen because I didn't have anyone to manage. I didn't have any songs to, to publish. I didn't have anything. But, uh, you know, I stayed in touch with those two acts. And uh, those two acts, a year later, came with me, and that's how this whole thing began. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's so 39 Robert, years later, here you are. Yeah, and Rob Friedman uh, gave me my first top 10 hit, Don't Shed a Tear by Paul Carrick. And Bob Halligan, uh, the band broke up, and Bob Halligan stayed with me. And uh, we had loads of success. We had covers up the kazoo, cover recordings. And, uh, you know, it, uh, and I managed, I found, you know, I met Mark Ribbler, and I managed him for a bunch of years. And I had uh, Kid in Canada, Kevin Jordan, Coco. We won a Juno Award, uh, which was the Canadian Grammy. Yep. And, uh, you know, and I had a bunch of other things along the way. You know? So those two guys that you defended, that they stuck with you. That was really cool. Yes. They, that was good later, validation. Until later they came with me. Yeah. That's great, man. And I had, uh, you know, I don't know, a uh, 15-year run with each of them, something like that. That's great. You know. What are some of the challenges of, of your business in general? You mean over the years? Yeah, because I know today it's a different ballgame, just over the years. Some of the challenges was uh, very simple. Making things happen. Getting past the gatekeepers. And uh, it, none of it was easy. Give me an example. Well, you know, uh, let me uh, see examples. You know, getting an act signed to a label at the time wasn't easy. So we had to do a lot of, you know, I did a lot of independent things. Uh, getting songs uh, covered, you know, getting uh, sync licenses. None of this has ever been easy. And I didn't, uh, and I had friends in the business and none of them helped me. I had, a, I had everything that happened for me came from strangers. So is that because they, they just didn't have the opportunity or they just busy with doing their own stuff I'll or, it, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to figure out why. Sure. But at the same time, I don't beg people, you, you know, uh, I, you know what I'm doing, you know, you know where I'm at. I tell you, you know, I show you my wares and da 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 and if you want to be helpful and friendly and everything else great if you don't want to be it's great also i'm not going sure. to dislike you because you didn't help me right right my relationships over the years have never been based on what somebody can do for me sure sure because i have one friend who's still very much in my life 40 years later who could have done a lot for me and didn't do anything uh, you never configure people out sometimes <clears throat> well, you don't know what it is. You don't know whether they have image issues, uh, whether, you know, they, they see you in, in a certain way or a certain yeah. light. You know, who knows what, you know, I, uh, I ended up in the music industry. I didn't become a psychiatrist. Right. <laughs> although although you, you become one when you're in the music industry. Sure. You know, I've always said, to, you know, when you manage people, you know, you got to be like a mother, a father, a rabbi, and a priest. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably accurate. You got to be all of those things wrapped in one when you're managing people. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, but it, it's, been a, it's been a fun journey, and, you know, because uh, I was able, when I went out on my own, I was able to work with the, the people that I enjoyed being with, 
the people that, uh, you know, I felt were gifted. And I never looked back, nor did I uh, care about how successful something was going to become or not become. I wasn't doing it based on just making money. Sure. Yes, we have to earn a living. We all need to earn a living. Uh, we all have bills to pay and obligations. But at the same time, uh, I never made my decisions based on getting rich with any of these people. Right. I made my decisions based on enjoying the people. Gotcha. Which is probably why you've had longevity in the business. Probably. And it's also uh, probably, you know, I can honestly say from the day I met all the people that I worked with over the years, they were all further along later on. Right. So you had an impact. As a result of being in my life. Right. You, you were an expert witness in a music industry trial of the Cameron organization versus Marie Dixon. What was that case about and what were you giving your expert opinion on? Okay, well, I started this music managers forum. The inter, it was called the International Managers Forum in 1993. <coughs> you know, I woke up one day in 1990 and... Uh, you know, uh, Rat was selling millions and Warrant and uh, this hair band and that hair band. Mm -hmm. I went to sleep that night, woke up the next day, they were gone. <laughs> and it was Nirvana. <laughs> it was Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden. Right. <laughs> so my whole life changed overnight. Right. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Right. So, uh, and my father was very ill at the time. Hmm. And I ended up uh, losing him in 91, unfortunately. Hmm. And uh, so I started saying to myself, you know, maybe it's time to give back, to do some charity work or something. So that's, you know, uh, a friend of mine uh, dragged me to a meeting at the, uh, one of the hotels uptown. And there was three, four hundred people there. And uh, it was uh, some people from the UK who had started the Managers Forum over there a few months earlier. <coughs> and they came to the US because they wanted to try to get a chapter or something going here. Sure. And it really, I was listening to what they were saying and it really resonated to me. Although there was, you know, like I say, three, four hundred people that most of them didn't get it because everybody's saying, can you help us? Can you show us? How do you do this? How is this going to happen? How does this begin? How did you start your organization? I raised my hand because I was very excited about this whole thing. And I got recognized and I said, I'll tell everybody here how this happens. I'll explain it to you. I said, they have their own issues and their own access to grind back in the UK. I says, I'll tell you how this works. Everybody sitting here today who's excited and interested in doing something, you hand me a business card. And in three, four weeks from now, I will call you. And that's how it begins. <laughs> and then we sit down and we talk about putting together a board, an agenda, and what we're going to do. Right. I said, that's how it happens. I got 35 business cards. And I purposely said, I'll call you in three, four weeks. Yeah, I was thinking about that. What, why did you do that? I'll tell you why. Because when you're at a revival meeting, which is like what we were at that day. Oh, yeah, you're looking to vet. Excited. Yeah, everybody's yeah. Everybody's excited. Right. You know, Smart, man. Want to do this and da, da, da. I figured, let me wait four weeks and see who's real. Yeah. Well, that makes a all the 35 people and there were two real ones out of 35. Yeah. That's not surprising. That's not because surprising. I wanted to really do something, but I wanted to do it with serious people. All right. I didn't want to do it with people that were pumped up today and tomorrow the air goes out of the balloon. Yeah. The next flashy thing is in front of them. Yes. Yeah. So that's how I uh, decided to do uh, uh, how we did it. So and that's how the music, uh, the International Managers Forum started. But we had to change the name down the road because uh, I started getting calls for the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. 
<laughs> Not your expertise necessarily. <laughs> no. So the whole IMF, IMF, IMF around the world, the couple of chapters that existed at the time, we all ch we ended up changing the name to the MMF, the Music right. Managers Forum. <coughs> Um, so it's really the international managers forum, the IMF. So how did what was this Cameron organization? Oh, oh, yeah. So yeah. here here I am, and that's in '93, and I, I think a year or two later, I think that was in '95, if I'm not mistaken, the Cameron organization. I'd have to look it up. Well, what happened is I got a call from this attorney at Mitchell Silverberg and Nup in California. And uh, it's pretty amazing that you remember the name of the firm's name amongst the millions of attorneys firms. You must and, have an excellent the lawyer that called me was a guy named George Burkowski. Yeah, that's pretty wild that you and you... he was partnered up there with Russell Frackman, who became a big attorney who did Napster and did all the big cases. Well, they called me and said to me the following. They said, you know, Barry, we've been watching you uh, with the managers forum. And uh, you see, did you ever do expert witness work? I said, no. Uh, they said, we have a case and we'd like to know. And they started to tell me about this case, which I will discuss in a minute. And they, uh, and, uh, I, and they said, uh, do you think you'd be interested? I said, well, I'd have to really look this thing over and think it through. I said, because... Uh, I said, it's not just about the money. I said, I got to believe in the case. Sure. I said, if I don't believe in this case, I can't give it my all. Mm. So they sent me over all the paperwork and da 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 da. And they asked me, uh, no, they told me all about it, I should say. And they said, are you going to be out in LA? We'd like to meet you. I said, uh, I have no plans. So they said, well, you know, we'll give you a call in a couple of weeks and see what's happening. Meanwhile, I understand they're talking to other uh, people to be expert witnesses sure. on the case. And I understand they called some of the biggest guys. And th for some reason, they kept coming back to me. And they came back to me again. And they said to me, uh, are you uh, getting any closer to coming out to L.A.? I said, not really. I said, you know something, guys, if you really want to meet me, it's very simple. You send me a plane ticket. You rent me a car. Yeah. You uh, get me a hotel. And you pay me for my day. And I'll come out and see you. That was a bright idea. I, I mean, you'd think that they, I, I mean, I was shocked that you, you even had a spoon feed them this. Yeah, that was a bright idea. And it happened, you know, when, after I thought of it. You know, this was, uh, you know, a, a major, uh, you know, thing. So I went out there and they had the client and, the, and a couple of attorneys in the room and they grilled me about a bunch of things. And uh, they came back to me later and said they wanted to hire me. Mm. And here, here's what the case was basically about. The case was about... Uh, uh, this manager, Scott Cameron, who had worked with Willie Dixon, uh, the uh, the blues guy. Yeah, of course. You know, for you know, they were like brothers, the two of them. They, it was like a you know a mad love affair between the two of them, and uh, they were had worked together. I don't know, twenty years, however long it was, thirty years. And they had some agreements and some things between them. All of a sudden, Willie Dixon gets uh, ill. And he's uh, on his, uh, you know, deathbed. And he gets a, uh, and Scott Cameron receives a letter from uh, Willie Dixon rescinding all the agreements. And it was a very hot time for, uh, for uh, blues. You know, the, the late 80s and 90s. And, and uh, Eric Clapton had done a, a Willie Dixon album that sold millions. And uh, this one had done, you know, uh, you know, blue stuff. Willie Dixon was hot as, hot as a pistol. Sure. What basically happened is uh, 
Willie Dixon's wife, uh, you know, the, who, the estate, she decided she doesn't want to pay commissions anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, her husband's dying. She doesn't want to pay commissions. Yeah. I think, you know, Willie Dixon had passed away. I think uh, if Willie Dixon knew what was happening, he would have filed for divorce. Right. Because he, uh, he loved Scott Cameron. It was an unbelievable relationship. Unbelievable. And Scott Cameron decided to go and sue uh, the estate. For and, the commissions uh, he's owed. Yeah, you know, yeah. for the commissions and, uh, and for them to live up to the agreements that sure. they had. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, Mitchell Silverberg ended up hiring me to represent them and Scott Cameron and be right. the expert witness. And uh, it's funny, when I went to the, uh, you know, I... Uh, and it was a great gig. Needless to say, expert witness work pays very, very well. Yeah. And I was going to be an expert based on the contracts and based right. on, the, on the, the management agreements and everything else that they had. And I felt very comfortable about it. And I really felt for uh, Scott uh, Cameron, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the things that I think one of the reasons they hired me and wanted me and it gave them great credibility was the fact that I was a I was a big artist advocate and the industry knew it I always was on the side of the act and now I'm on the side of the manager right so they you had you didn't you weren't this uh, shrewd you know business shark yeah I was uh, I was on the side of the manager and I and I belonged to the managers forum I was the head mm -hmm. of that the founder and the head so they, uh, it was a, a great fit, you know, and I went ahead and I used to, you know, I used to, you know, uh, I would go out there and they, uh, they really trained me on how to handle a jury. And, you know, the, there's, there's a method to all of this stuff Yeah. and how to deal with the judge. They really gave me a, a you know, Great. I learned a lot. Yeah. I learned a lot. And uh, I spent, uh, you know, over a month on this case. And I would go out there, go to court, and come back and go to court. I did depositions. I was deposed and did this, that, and the next thing. And I'm convinced we're winning the case. Right. I'm convinced. And I knew the experts on the other side, a bunch of criminals, <laughs> you know, a uh, bunch of guys that, uh, you know, uh, they would have walked over their mothers. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, I felt pretty comfortable about this, and I knew I had the judge. But as the law, law firm said to me, as the law team said to me, Barry, don't be so overconfident <laughs> because you never know what a jury is going to do. But I did all my testifying and uh, my depositions and testifying and all my court stuff. And uh, they wanted to continue to retain me to consult them on the case, which was great. I loved it. Sure. But I'll never forget, uh, there was a couple of, uh, I'll never forget one of the, uh, a couple of incidences that happened during this case. You know, it goes to show you, uh, you know, these cases, boy, are they about winning. You know, I, uh, there was one instance where I flew in on a Thursday to be uh, in court on Friday. And then I'd go home Friday night. So was, you were earning your money. Oh, yeah. Well, I knew every time I got called, it was three days work. Yeah. You know, they, they paid for, you know, travel days. Well, so it's, it's, it's a lot of work, though, traveling yeah. back and forth and then yeah. got to go. Yeah. It's not easy. It's a yeah. lot of work. I agree. So I'm sitting in court all day and they don't call me. Nothing happens. So the lawyers all come over to me. The firm comes to me, the team. And they said, Barry, do you think you can stay over the weekend? You know, uh, I said, I don't know about that. <clears throat> this was early in the day they said that to me. So I said, I'll think about it. I said, I was planning on going home tonight. So uh, they come back to me later in the day, and they said, do you think you can stay? We'd love to make sure you're here. So I said, 
truthfully, guys, I'll be honest with you. I didn't bring clothes. <laughs> I said, I'm, uh, I was here for today to go home. Right. I'll never forget the response. Go out, buy whatever you need. I don't care if you buy three suits. Uh, just be here Monday morning. All right, All right. I ended up, I stayed over. They said, otherwise, we'll fly you home and fly you back Sunday. <laughs> yeah, who the hell wants to deal with that? Yeah. No. So, uh, unless you're into frequent flyer points. I guess. Yeah, uh, into miles. But, uh, so I stayed over. And, uh, you know, that worked out. But I was wild where they said, just go out shops, give us the bill, send us the bill, whatever you need, just go buy it. Because they're not paying for it either. I know. the <laughs> <today>. Yeah. <laughs> what do they care? It's going to come out of the case. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and we had one other incident that really stands out to me. I'm uh, on the stand and I'm being cross-examined and I'm being asked a question and I go blank. I'm just totally forget everything. I asked them to repeat the question 17 times. No. Yes. Until <laughs> I finally got my composure and came back to myself. Man, I give you credit for having the balls to do that. <laughs> 17 <laughs> times I asked them to repeat the question. <clears throat> <laughs> and then I finally answered it and da 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 da. Yeah. I get off the stand. The lawyers all come rushing over to me and pull me outside and said, what was that all about? It was great. You drove them crazy. What was the strategy? <laughs> I said, don't worry about it. It worked. Yeah. That's a... <laughs> so that what was, was what was the net? Well, what, the net, what do you mean? The net? Uh, like the net, net impact of like did, who won? Well, what ended up happening is I'm convinced we're winning this case. Thoroughly convinced. Yeah. And I'm reassuring them 26 times, you know, that we're, you know, we're going to be fine. That's funny. You're the, you're reassuring the attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm home and the phone rings one day. And uh, George says to me, Barry, I'm calling you. And I don't have great news. Oh. The jury went against us. I said, what? I said, George? you got to uh, appeal this. This has got to be appealed. We won that case. I don't care. We won it. I know That's we funny. have. you got to you, you got to uh, appeal this. He said, yes, we are going to appeal this. I was concerned at the time because they owed me thousands of dollars. Oh, for all your, yeah. That. So, but, the, but he says to me right away, he said, Barry, you did an excellent job. I said, I appreciate that. He said, I've instructed the client to send you a check and pay you. Awesome. Good. Everything that's due, we will wait for hours. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, we want you to get paid. I said, George, something is not right here. I said, I know I had the judge. I know the judge loved me. I You're said, funny. I know. Something is not right here. The whole yeah. legal system is not right. <laughs> well, the wind up is five, six late, weeks later, he calls me back and he says to me, are you sitting down? I said, yeah. He says, let me tell you what happened. The judge reviewed the case. And she said that the jury did not follow instructions. And she's reversed the verdict. Holy crap. She's reversed the verdict. Wow. I said, what? And I said, please explain all of this to me. And which they did. And the wind up was... It held. That's and great. We won the case. Good. Did you feel better? Uh, did I feel better? I was uh, jumping for joy. Did you feel justice was served now? You're able to sleep yeah. now? Yes. Yeah. Well, we, he, Scott deserved to win. Mm. And uh, it would have been a travesty of justice if he hadn't. But yeah. uh, it was amazing. You know, it was amazing. Then you did, uh, you testified in Congress in a hearing on something called H.R. 1506, which is Digital Performance Right in Sound Recording Acts of 1995. 
which yeah. was a bill that got signed into law. What was that all about? And how did you get involved with this? Oh, wow. Yes. Uh, in 1993, I, when we started the Managers Forum, and there was only, you know. So this Managers Forum turned out to be a good gig for you as well. well uh, the like visibility forum, wise. Which was, uh, it was all my, it was my charity work. Sure. Right. I understand. But I have to say it was probably the best thing I did my whole career. Yeah. Okay. Cool. The best thing I ever did. Uh, and I learned that, uh, that, uh, charity work can be very uh, rewarding. So, uh, what ended up happening there is we were having a, a board meeting one day in, in 1990, two year, two years later in the early 1995, uh, sometime in the, in the early 1995. And this whole thing was coming up in the industry of digital performance rights. Right. And, uh, you know, it was uh, years prior to uh, sound exchange being uh, coming into existence to pay royalties to digital performance rights. And it was years before uh, there was an iTunes or a, an Amazon or anything else uh, that uh, would... Uh, you know, have digital music. Well, I said, I said to everybody, I said, you know, guys, we have to uh, do something and we have to do something that's going to put money in people's pockets. And that's what's going to launch this organization and really make it a bigger deal. I said, we got to put money in managers' pockets and do something positive. So they said, uh, you're right. And then they said, so, uh, you know, and there was going to be hearings being held in Washington at the time. So I said to them. On uh, digital performance rights. On digital performance yeah. rights. They were going to have hearings for this uh, new uh, right that, uh, that everybody was, that people were talking about. And, you know, I look at these hearings, at the, who's going to be at these hearings, and it's all the corporations. You know, it's the corporations and the unions. Right. They want to own everything. They want everything. Well, I said to my, my guys, my board, I said, guys, we got to get into these hearings and we got to do something. And uh, right away, everybody says to me, who do we know in Washington? I said, nobody. I said, we'll meet them. You, so you picked up the phone and you got the phone book. <laughs> I picked up the phone and this time it was 41 phone calls. <laughs> I remember the number. I kept track of everything because I would call in the morning, lunchtime, mid-afternoon, late afternoon on different days to try to get somebody on the yeah. phone that I could get through to and hear me. You know, you could get people on the phone, but they couldn't care less. Sure. Well, on the 41st phone call, an attorney picked up by accident and I knew I had 30 seconds or 20 seconds to get his interest. Your elevator pitch. And I said to him right away, I said, you know, you guys have hearings coming up for HR 1506, you know, digital performance rights. And I know you want to do the right things, but you can't be doing the right things if you're going to hold hearings and have no managers represented and no artists. I said, you can't be making laws that are going to affect my life and my organization's life and nobody's represented at your hearings. And I piqued his interest. Right. And he wanted to talk further. I said, you're getting a lot of misinformation. I said, if this right is to be created, I said, you know, the corporations, you know, want to be the beneficiaries of, of the whole pot of new gold. Yeah. I said, and you know, I said, I know you want to run a fair hearing. Am I wrong? He said, of course you're not wrong. Yeah. I said, so tell me, how can you do that without having managers and artists represented? And he was lost for an answer. So, uh, you know, he, I said to him, you know, and I told him all about the MMF, you know, the IMF, the IMF at the time. And I told him what we do and da, 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 da. And I said to him, you know, we should be represented, you know, because we represent, uh, you know, all of these managers and recording artists. He said, you know, 
Mr. Bergman, I think you're right. Let me talk to the powers to be here and see what I can do. What's going on here? And I must say, I think uh, times were a lot different back then than they are today because they, they did want to run a fair hearing. Yeah. Anytime you know? someone wants to run something fair, it is different than today. Yeah, that was 1995. So two, three weeks later, I got a call from Henry Hyde's office. And uh, the staff has said to me, Barry Bergman, I said, yes. Is this the, uh, the, the manager's forum? Yes. Uh, and uh, she said to me, uh, we'd like to invite you to testify at our hearings coming up. I said, great. And she told me everything we had to do, and they sent me paperwork and everything else. And I called a, a board meeting, and I told everybody, you guys are going to do all the paperwork and everything else, and I will go there and give my sermon on the mount. We'll talk about my sermon. Uh, <laughs> sermon on the mount. <laughs> yeah, my sermon on the mount. You know, and uh, I was told also that afterwards the, the Congress people would grill me. And uh, I said to myself, you know, what's there to worry? I'm not going to worry about it because what little I know, they know less. Oh, God, yeah. Well, to make a long story short, <clears throat> I went down there the night before with uh, one of my board members. We were up till 3, 4 in the morning rehearsing mm -hmm. and going over all the questions that could be asked and this and that and the next thing. And the next morning, uh, Mark Ribler showed up at the hearing among uh, one or two others, right. other friends. It was, a, it was a packed house at the hearing room because it, it was a big deal, this thing. And yeah. I have to say, Mark, is, uh, Mark has been one of my uh, you know, greatest supporters throughout the, my uh, professional career. He spoke, he spoke so lovingly of you on, on his interview. Well, I love Mark. Yeah. I love Mark and I love his entire family and always have, you know, and uh, we've had a, a great relationship over the years and it's, uh, you know, been unbelievable. But uh, so I uh, get up the next morning, uh, you know, and I'm not a morning person. I'm a night, we're in the music business, we're night <laughs> You know, and it's not easy getting up when you go to bed at four in the morning for a nine o'clock hearing. Oh, yeah. You know, and there I am all decked out. I had to uh, dust off a suit, and get all the cobwebs off because who wears suits in this business? Right. You know, I can't remember the last time I wore one. And, uh, and the wind up was I go in there and I gave my sermon but uh, I gave my uh, Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> I'm going to backtrack a minute, and then we'll get to that. Okay? Yeah. I want to backtrack and say that when I was invited to, to the hearing, and we went, up on, we went up on that congressional calendar, my phones were ringing off the hook. <clears throat> People were calling me, all the, uh, the corporations and everything else. Oh, to find out what you were going to say. Exactly. Oh, Wow. Because the they want they wanted to have a defense for it. Well, the RIAA. Right. My, uh, you know, uh, I love the, some of those guys, and I love the guy that, that Carrie Sherman, who's uh, who's uh, now retired, and they got Mitch Glazer, and that was great. But we had uh, Hillary Rosen there years ago, and I ended up liking her too. But she was difficult in the beginning, and whatnot. Well, the RIAA calls me. And they send four people to take me out for lunch. Oh, my God. And, uh, you know, we go to this uh, lovely Italian restaurant uptown, the five of us. And they want to help me write my speech. <laughs> they're all afraid. They want to help you write your yeah. speech. Yeah. They're all afraid that, you know, I'm going to ruin their agenda. Of course. Yeah. You know? Which is what I was there to do. Right. Of course. You know, and uh, so they said to me, I said, I don't need any help writing my speech. I said, I'm capable. I said, thank God. I said, I know what I'm doing in that department. I'll, know, I'll be fine. They said, great. And we're eating lunch and this and that. And one of them says, says to me, so what are you going to say? 
I said, it's very simple what I'm going to say. I said, I'm going to talk about the fact that if we get this uh, right, that it has to be non-recoupable and paid directly to the artist. That uh, you cannot recoup this against an album, right? Against a video, we want direct payment. I don't want money deducted against tour support or any. They, and they're looking at me now. They're getting upset. And one of them says, "How can you say that?" I said, "Come on, June twenty eighth. I think it was June twenty eighth." I says, "Come on, June twenty eighth, and you'll see how I say it." Yeah, good for you. And it's very simple how I'm going to say it. I said, because the reality of the whole right is if we don't get, you know, if we don't get direct payment, we're never going to see a nickel of this. Yeah. So uh, one of them storms out of the restaurant, you know. Only in New York do I hear sirens in the background. It's so funny. Yes, uh, we, got, we got some sirens going. Yeah. It'll pass by in a minute. This too oh. shall pass. Yeah, it's cool. I grew up there, man. I'm just, I, It's just funny, though. I haven't had to deal with it in so many years, but it's so noticeable when you don't have to deal with it. Yes, okay. They're on the way out now. <laughs> you have some nerve interrupting me. <laughs> so uh, where, where were we here now? Oh, so uh, You told them what you are going to say, come June 28th? Yeah. Yeah. One of them storms out. I think it was June 28th. I'm not exactly. It was June something in there. Uh, one of them storms out of the, uh, the, the the lunch. How can you say that? I said, very simple. Come and you'll see. Yeah. They were very unhappy. Yeah. Needless to say. And that's fine. So we, uh, we went and I rehearsed all night, uh, like I said. And then the next morning I got up to give my speech. I gave my testimony. Uh, I testified and said what I felt about the direct payments and everything else. And I gave all the examples. In fact, it's online. You can, it can be read. Hmm. What I said. And Billboard was there and everyone else was there. You know, it was a, it was a big deal. And the windup was I get grilled afterwards for 40 minutes. And every question that they asked me, I should have went to sleep at one o'clock. Every day. Oh, it was, it was nothing. Day, they never asked one question that we rehearsed. Yeah. You know, That's the I way should, it always, you know, you always plan for the future and. Yeah. You, you can't plan. No. So the wind up was I, uh, you know, and I remember the, the first question and I said to myself, the only way I'm going to make, make a breakthrough here with these serious politicians is if I, uh, I bring some levity to the uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. So the first question that was asked uh, to me of a congressman from somewhere in Ohio was uh, he asked the following. He said, if this right is to happen, how much of this pot of gold, this new pot of gold, do you think Otter should get? I said, congressman, that's a great question. And I said, I'll give you my answer. I said, I believe we should get 100% of the money. And everybody cracked up, which is what I wanted. Right. Said, but we all know that's not going to happen. Right. Okay, good move. Said, we all know that's not going to happen. I said, but to be fair, it should be 50-50. 50% for the copyright owners and 50% and uh, you know, for, the, for the artists. I said, that would be fair. And then they asked a bunch of other questions. And I remember there was this uh, congressman from uh, California, this real big, heavy set dude. And uh, he grabs me afterwards <coughs> and gives me a bear hug in the lobby and says, son, you got to work the holes here. You're going to do very, very well. <laughs> you got to work the holes. I said, thank you. I appreciate your support. And uh, the windup was Clinton signed it into law on, uh, I think it was November 1st. Right. Uh, Clinton signed it into law right on your birthday. <laughs> that you remember. 
1995. And he, uh, and we got, ended up getting, uh, it was 45% uh, for featured artists. That's great. Yeah, two and a half percent for AFTRA. Okay. For the background singers. Right, uh, right. And two and a half percent uh, to the uh, musicians union. That's cool. Players. Yeah, which was fair. It was good. Now, but we didn't get direct payment. And, uh, and you know, what I, what I was lobbying for, you know, and I spent seven more years, uh, you know, seven years on direct payment. Wow. And, we didn't get direct payment when the, uh, you know, in the law. It didn't happen in the law. <laughs> but what happened then around 2000, I think it was, or 2001, Sound Exchange was going to come into being. And uh, Sound Exchange is the organization like ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC that pays out the digital performance right royalties. And. Uh, they uh, did not. They were financed by the major labels. Oh. They were financed by the major labels. So you know they had their mantra, of, uh, and uh, you know they had their their marching orders of what they really had to do. So <coughs> what we decided to do was we were going to try to build another organization, raise money, and build another organization to go against Sound Exchange to compete with them. Unfortunately, we had the tech bubble in 2001. Right. And Wall Street fell apart. There was the end of our financing. Right, right. Nothing was, it wasn't going to happen. So now we have to figure out another, th another tech, thing. That we yeah, the tech bubble was early 2000s, right? And yeah, then 2008 2000, was a real estate. 2000, yeah. 2001. Right, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what ended up happening is, uh, we, uh, I, you know, I, I had this uh, thought, well, maybe what we can do is help prevent people from signing up and becoming members of Sound Exchange. <laughs> you know, if they can't get a board together, they got a problem. So we let the word out to everybody and went after everybody and we got people to, to not join. Oh. <clears throat> and then we finally got them to agree to change to changing uh, some of the uh, uh, to changing uh, you know some, some of their bylaws and to make it like ASCAP where it would be, the board at Sound Exchange would be half copyright owners half artists and they agreed to direct payment oh that's cool good it took six seven years and uh, then you know uh, we, uh, you know, I was running around blessing them. Very cool. So you had a pretty big role in it. You know, that's another thing. That's a feel good thing, right? Well, I'll tell you, you know, you talk about having a big role in it. They sent around some amendments, which I have here, and I'm a signatory on the agreement. Oh, that's cool, man. With all the major labels. That's great. In so you don't, years, that's I would have a... never thought something like that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, man. Is there anything, if you could go back and give young Barry advice, as soon as you, assuming you'd listen, is there anything you would have told yourself that would have made your life easier, professionally, personally, anything? Yes. I would have told myself, allow people to be who they are. Don't try to change anyone. Because if we're lucky in this life, maybe you can change yourself. Yeah, man, if you're lucky. <laughs> but, you know, I used to think as a child that I could uh, make everything better. Save somebody. Yes, uh, you know, and, and, and it doesn't work. No, man, it doesn't work at all. That's un ain't that the truth. It just makes you frustrated. And you're like, what the hell's? Why can't they see my opinion? No, Why can't somebody you can do, but you can't uh, make them better or change them? Yeah, absolutely, man. All right, tell me, uh, I'm sure you've been to dozens of concerts. Tell me the best two or three concerts you've ever seen. Now, that is a rough question. I'm sure. But I will tell you, it's, I'll tell you about, 
a series of concerts that yeah. I went that two, I'll give you two series of concerts. Mm -hmm. And the first one are the Alan Freed shows. Yeah, I figured you were going to say that. I went to all of them. Why don't and you, for the people who don't know who Alan Freed Alan is. Alan Freed was a Cleveland disc jockey who came to New York City, was on 1010 Wins, W-I-N-S, which is the top news station in the city today. Right. And has been for, I don't know, Ages, man. Ages. Yeah. But Alan Freed was like a Svengali. If he played a record and told you that this record was going to be a hit, you bought it and it became a hit. And he was like uh, mesmerizing. And he was the first guy that ever started rock and roll shows. Hmm. And he, uh, it used to be called... Uh, you know, and I and I know this might sound controversial, but the, uh, what we call rock and roll music used to be called race music. Wow! And he changed the name and coined the name rock and roll. Wow! I didn't know that. I, I did yeah. not. That's cool. And uh, the reason why uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is in Cleveland is because of Alan Freed. Oh. So Alan Freed came to New York and revolutionized the industry. And unfortunately, he was involved in payola. Yeah. <clears throat> and it brought him down and he died young. Yeah, that's too bad. So the series of Alan Freed shows, those were great. And there used to be like 10, 12 acts on these shows. They'd all play their hit single or two. And there was a house band that used to be uh, either Big Al Sears Oh, uh, you know, one of those, you know, uh, one of two or three uh, names would be the house band. And uh, the acts would come out, and, you know, some of them had a guitar player or didn't have a guitar player. But I saw, you know, uh, I, I, I met a lot of them. You know, I saw the Everly Brothers uh, there, uh, you know, Buddy Holly, uh, Chuck Berry, Screaming Jay Hawkins. You know, Danny and the Juniors, Ruth Brown, all the greats. You know, so that series of shows, you can lump them into one, is one of my two. Right. And my second group of shows that I saw that uh, were amazing to me was Bruce Springsteen at Max's Kansas City, downtown New York. Wow. Where I used to go and have dinner with friends downstairs, and then we go upstairs and see the show, and I'd be like three feet away from him. That's so cool. And, and I saw a bunch of Bruce Springsteen shows there, a bunch. And because, uh, I, I, you know, I got turned on to Bruce Springsteen by, uh, uh, you know, a friend of mine early on by the name of Richie Buckland. And he turned me on to Springsteen, and that was in the early 70s, before anything ever happened. Yeah. And I thought Springsteen was amazing. And I still do. And I, uh, you know, one of the things I raced to see was when he was on Broadway. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I went to see that. Tell me one more, because I know you've seen tons of shows. I'll tell you one more. The other act that I really loved that... In fact, I booked them. Was Peter, Paul, and Mary. Wow. When I was at NYU, when I was on the program board, I booked them to do two shows. And I loved Peter, Paul, and Mary. Did you ever do any work with the, the, the DJs at uh, WABC? Because they were huge, no, man. No. no. Interesting. Were they not open to stuff like that or... What do you mean? Like to just interacting with people or was that too late? Uh, I don't know. That might have been later on. Yeah. Okay. I never had any relationships with those people. I mean, I mean you know, later on, uh, you know, you, it was Rick Sklar who did the programming in the, uh, in the uh, you know, 70s and 80s. And then he so when they, when when they worked? Surgery and passed away. Who did you work with in the city, radio station-wise, or if anybody? Station-wise, I used yeah. to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I was close to Bobby Rich, and uh, 
Rob Cisco at 99X. I haven't heard 99X in ages. <laughs> well, I broke the meatloaf record there. The same. Oh, the okay. Uh, and I was close to uh, Neil McIntyre and his wife at WPIX. That's interesting. All right, another tough question. Tell me, your, uh, as I'm looking at your thousands of records and CDs behind you, top three, just for this minute, Desert Island Discs. Oh, that's another rough question. Oh, I know. Top three, Desert Island Discs. Born to Run. Uh, Tom Petty, Damn the Torpedoes. And the uh, first Peter, Paul, and Mary album. <coughs> that was which easy. I have, which I have right behind me. The original. Yeah. Man, it's so, there's no place to buy records anymore in the city. Uh, well, we have new record stores, and they're called Amazon. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, the, there used to be so many used record stores, man. Yeah. And the, you'd spend a day, and you couldn't cover yeah. them all. Yeah, I had Tower Records, which was big, Sam Goody's. Oh, even all the used stores in the village, yeah. you know, there was tons of them. There's only a very uh -huh. couple now. I know, man. All right. Best decision you ever made, Barry? Best decision I ever made was when, uh, when I started the MMF, the Music Managers Forum. Really? Why is that? Because it led to so many uh, opportunities. And it opened the doors to so many people. And it allowed me to uh, help others, which was very important to me. That's great. So it was like a total win all around. Oh, yes. That's so cool. I had it to do all over again. I do it the same way. Yeah. What makes you happy? What makes me happy? Seeing my friends happy. My friends are a huge part of my life. And when they're feeling good and up, I'm up. Always been like that? Yes. I'm not about material things. Material things don't make me happy. Huh. I am about, I am a people person. And uh, it's uh, seeing the joy of others is what makes me happy. Yeah. Speaking of happy, happiest moment or happiest time in your life? Well, this one's going to surprise you. This was about, I don't know, 16, 17 years ago, 18 years ago. I got a call for the uh, MMF on a Friday afternoon, about 5.30 my time, quarter to six. That's a young fella, 23 years old. And he's asking me a lot of questions about his band. <laughs> and I'm answering his questions. But I'm very, uh, a lot of people hear, a lot of people see, people are audio, people are visual. I feel. Kinesthetic. I feel. Something didn't feel right on that call. So I went ahead and asked him if he could stay put, uh, if he could uh, hold on a minute. I said, I gotta make a quick call, hold on. And I made a call and I canceled out my Friday night, not knowing what was coming. And I got back on the phone with him and I kept him talking and kept him talking. And I finally found out he was getting ready to kill himself. Holy crap. 23 years old. His band was falling apart. 
he had a blowout with his mother and father and he broke up with his girlfriend all in the same week and I guess I don't know but I guess when you're 23 years old your world is over when you're going through all of that it depends on your coping <laughs> skills man yeah I guess I stayed on the phone with him for three and a half hours until I was able to thank God bring him down and I told him that he needed to call me the next day and the next day after that and the next day after that and he did because I told him I said to him I may not have I may not know you I may never have met you but I love you and I don't want you to hurt me right now and the wind up was uh, I was able to uh, bring them back to the planet. <clears throat> and the happy moment was six years ago when I had a big birthday. And I was talking to him. He had called. And I told him that, uh, you know, there was going to be a big party and this and that and the next thing. And he was based in L.A., based in Northern California. He, was, he had moved him. He was married with a child in Iowa. Obviously, he found a new girlfriend and got married. Obviously, he made up with his family, etc. His life came back somewhat. <coughs> well, he says to me, I need a favor. And I says, what is that? He said, Barry, I need an invitation to the party. And he flew into the party. And he got up in front of 25 people and told them what happened. Wow. And that to me was probably one of the happiest moments of my life. Wow. That's pretty emotional, man. I don't think that I will ever do anything, whatever it is, that will ever top that one. So the MMF... You know, uh, was was without a doubt the best thing I have ever done in my life. Not just for the business stuff, but even personally. Yeah. To have had that opportunity is pretty pretty powerful, yeah. man. Yeah. That was a major event. I haven't heard from him the last couple of years, so I don't know what's going on. But uh, you know, eventually, I guess he'll surface again. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, man, for sharing that. That was really cool. I was, uh, you know, all the guests at the party were shocked. Yeah, that's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, well, he said to me on the phone, he said, I really want to come in and meet some of your friends. And he came in, we spent the weekend. We ran around, I took him all, you know, around town. Yeah. To a Broadway show, took him elsewhere. And, uh, you know, you know, you do the best you can do in this life. Sure. But That's I, feel, a... I feel so blessed that I had that opportunity. Oh, yeah. Uh, who's had the biggest influence on you musically in your career and then personally? <laughs> musically? Couldn't it be just personal? Or... Yeah, if you want, sure. Well, I'm very into astrology. There's actually two people. I'm very into astrology, and my astrologer, Felissa Rose, has been a major, major, major influence in my life. She's made, uh, you know, my life so much easier to live. In what way? But with the insights that I've gotten and the things that I've learned through my studies of astrology. You know, I've had a lot of realizations over the years. You know, I also credit her with, uh, you know, uh, going out on my own. Oh, so this is someone who's been in your life quite some time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's been in my life now since 1979. Oh, wow. Uh, how, if you don't mind me asking, and if you, you don't have to answer this, how did you wind up meeting her? <clears throat> it's funny. I'll tell you how I met her. I had a, a Wall Street client who... Uh, 
you know, a, a real straight laced guy, suit and tie and everything else. And when I left Wall Street, uh, you know, he picked up the phone one day and called me. And uh, he uh, said to me, uh, how's uh, the entertainment business treating you? And I was going through some rough times. At the, I wanted to leave Mark's music because I was unhappy there with the way some things were being run and the way I was being handled. So uh, he said to me, he said, take down this name and number. I want, I want you to go get your chart done. I was shocked I was hearing this from uh, this guy. And uh, he gave me her number and I called her up. And I always had an affinity to these, uh, you know, things. But uh, it's not as if you open up the yellow pages and you <laughs> find somebody. It's you don't open up the yellow pages for a doctor, you know. Yeah. You don't open. Hopefully. Up, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't open up one for an astrologer. And you know, we don't have yellow pages anymore. So. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, I called her up and I made an appointment to see her, and I'll never forget. Uh, what she said to me, I said, uh, she, we made an appointment for February 12th of 79. God, your memory is like. And she said to me, uh, she said, Barry, uh, I said to her, she said, I'll see you on February 12th. So I said, uh, unless there's a blizzard. And she said to me, no, you'll be here even if there's a blizzard. We had a blizzard and I was there. <laughs> <laughs> She's been one of my nearest and dearest friends over throughout the years. It's That's not that cool. I see her every week, but we, we talk all the time and uh, we are very much in touch. That's cool. So she's been, uh, you know, one of my major influences. And one of my clients was a major influence in my life. And uh, that's Rob Friedman, one of my, uh, one of the two people that originally. Uh, yeah, that originally credit, came with you. I credit with putting me into business. He's been a, you know, a major influence in a lot of good ways. You know, uh, he used to challenge me all the time on my bullshit. And, uh, you know, uh, I learned a lot from him. That's cool. You know, so those two were really stand out. Thanks. Uh, let me see if there's anybody musically that's an influence in any way. Uh, yeah, I, you know... I'd have to say, you know, Springsteen has been mm. an influence. And why has he been an influence? Because he represents the working man. Sure. And uh, I identify with that. I totally get that. We didn't talk about really your upbringing, but what's the most important thing your dad taught you? Well, what I, it's not what he taught me. It's what I observed. And that was having a, a great work ethic. Mm. How about your mom? Mother, and my mother, I learned one thing from her. What's that? that? really stood out to me over the years. And that is, Barry, you don't go out and buy anything unless you can afford to pay for it. Oh, that's good wisdom. That's sage advice, man. Buy what you can afford, man. So those were, you know, one was an observation and one was a lesson learned. Do you had any hobbies outside of music? Yes. Well, it's not a hobby necessarily, but I, I you know, I, uh, I love film. Okay. Like watching movies? Yeah, I love film. And when we had movie theaters uh, before COVID-19, I probably would go 130 times a year to the theaters. Oh, wow. So like every few days you're in the movies. <clears throat> yeah, I would go a couple times a week. Wow. What kind of movies do you like to see? I like all kinds of films, truthfully. Well, let me put it to you this way. I like great ones. <laughs> you, know, I, uh, you know, I picked Parasite uh, to win uh, the Oscar. Did it? You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't care if it was foreign language. I knew that... That thing was destined to go. And did it? Yes. It won. It won okay, yeah. The four major awards. A South Korean film. Wow. 
and uh, you know, film is a big one for me. And uh, that's the big one. Film. That's cool. Yeah, man. 130 movies a year. That's a lot of time involved. A uh, few questions left. Toughest decision you've had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Oh, okay. That one, I can tell you. I, uh, when I was at Mark's Music, I, uh, you know, my uh, closest friend, my close friend got me the job, actually got me the interview and got me the job. He was my ex-partner. And uh, now I'm working with him and I bring in the ACDC and the meatloaf. And he's not supportive of anything that I'm doing. He wants to produce records. It was all about him wanting to produce records. Right. <clears throat> so I had a little get together with him, a little, you know, talk, talk with him. And he was my boss there. And uh, there was a lot of tension between us. And I had a talk with him one day and I explained to him that this was not about him and not about me. This was about 35, 40 people that worked at the firm. Mm -hmm. and that if we don't ring the cash register and make something happen here, we'll all be out of work. So I said, you got to be supportive here. He didn't come to meetings that were important to me. He didn't care, basically. It was all about him. Well, and I, and I ended the meeting by saying to him the following, and I don't even know how these words came out of my mouth. I said to him, <coughs> if something doesn't change between us, if something doesn't change here, one of us is going to have to leave here. And it won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> How did that go down? Well, not very well. <laughs> but, you know... Things got worse and worse and worse over the next several months. And I had to figure out what I, how to do what I wanted to do. And I uprooted him and got him fired. Oh, you did? That was the roughest thing I ever had to do. Yeah. Considering how much he meant to me. Yeah. And I didn't sleep for months thinking about it. But I learned some big lessons from this one. And I learned the following, because when I was no longer at Mark's Music and I was at UA, the phone rang one day, and my secretary ran in and told me he was on the phone. Did I, should I get rid of him, she said to me. I said, no, I take every call. Yeah. So I took the phone call, and I asked him what was on his mind, and he said he needed to see me. So I said, you tell me when and where we could have lunch, and I'll take care of the lunch. So he said to me, can we meet tomorrow? I said, yes. I met him the following day for lunch. And, you know, we had some small talk and we're eating lunch. And I said to him, what do I owe this invitation to? And he said to me, Barry, I came here to apologize. Wow. I came here because you did the right thing. I was totally out of control. Two weeks after you got me fired, my wife took my daughter and left. Holy crap. My whole world came crashing down, and I've since gone for help, and I've realized a bunch of things. And he said, I came here to tell you you did the right thing and to thank you because it would have never gotten better. Wow. <clears throat> and I learned a, <clears throat> I learned yeah. a lot of things. T tell me. And one of the things I learned in this life, a bunch of them, is if you're going to be a leader in this life, you got to lead, even if you got to make the roughest of decisions. You, you, you got to make sometimes decisions that are going to be very, very, very difficult. 
I also learned that you need to do what you have to do when you know you're doing the right thing. And I knew getting rid of him was the right thing. It would have brought the whole firm down. And I also learned, and it's something that, you know, Mark and I would talk about over the years. I also learned that they all come back. When somebody goes out of your life and you know you didn't do anything wrong, it's usually an ego problem of some sort. Mm. And when they come back to the planet and they realize the error of their ways, they will call to apologize or come back. Because I've had people come back to my life, you know, months, weeks, and years later, where we had blowouts or whatever. Right. Because they knew they were wrong. Because nobody wants to lose something out of their life that they know was good. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, well, you know, if, you know, that's another thing I've learned in this life. Nothing goes out of your life, Craig, that you have to have in it. Yeah, that's true. I agree Something's with you. going out of your life, I open the door and help it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with you there. Because nothing goes out that you must have. Yeah. People want to hold on to everything. Yeah, man. Me, I want to hold on to the good and get rid of the bad. Yeah. Or get rid of the stuff that's used up its usefulness. Yeah. It no longer is relevant. So, and I also learned that I was being forced, because I had a lot of challenges put in my ways in my early years, I was being forced to become stronger and tougher. All right. And to not be afraid of making big decisions. What it really comes down to, I think the biggest lesson of it all is the following. We all have to become the people that we were born to be, not the people that we were raised to be. Who you're raised to be and who you really are can be two different people. Yeah. In most cases. And I obviously was born to be the person I've since become. Not the scared, bullied kid that I was raised to be. Yeah. You know, I grew up, I was a scared kid, a bullied kid, picked on. I thought I was stupid and everything else as a child. And uh, I've, since, I've realized over the years, and I've done it all by myself, but I've realized that wasn't me. That was somebody I don't even know who it was. Yeah. So that was the roughest decision. Yeah. Having to uproot my best friend at the time. I always say you can rewrite your own ending, man. You know, I think you really can. Well, and you know, we all have decisions that we have to make in this life. Yeah. And we all have choices. And the question is, which choice do you make? Yeah, totally. I'm always looking at the greater good or trying to think about what the greater good is. And uh, if somebody's standing in the way of the greater good, I'm going to get, get them out of the way. Did you, think, you, did you think like that when you were younger as well? No. Hmm. I... Uh, started to think like this as I, you know, got older and more mature. Yeah. yeah. I made decisions, and half the times I don't even know why I made the decisions. They just felt like the right things to do. Right. I agree with you, man. When you make a decision that's in line with, like, you know, universal harmony, for lack of a better, it is an easier decision to make. And the the... I have this thing on here, and my my pace it here. Take the path of least stress, and, I, and that always seems to I'll, be the. I'll, I'll I'll run into the stress if I have to. Yeah. I don't care. I'll run into it, not yeah. away from it. I always take the path of least stress. Now I've had too much. I've made a lot well, of bad I decisions. I can honestly <laughs> say, uh, you know, uh, you know, there are things that are stressful that you have to go through, like family things and. 
other sure. things. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I can honestly say that, uh, you know, one of the bad, bad, you know, one of the good decisions was going to go out on my own. You know, one of, you know, it was, I was able to do the things that I wanted the way that I wanted to do them my way. And, uh, I was able to, uh, work at my pace, do the things that I wanted to do with the people that I wanted to do it with. And I always thought that that was the right way, you know? I, uh, you know, I try not to come from fear. Right. I've since written a book that's sitting on my desk here, that my life story. When's it coming out, man? Uh, you know, it's been sitting here for years, and it's, it's right, you know, I'll, I'll show it to you in a minute. But it's called Fear is Just Another Four-Letter Word. When's it? That's not like you. You got a. You're a doer. <laughs> it's got. Uh, you know. At some point, I don't know. I have to uh, put, get the finished chap, the final chapter in there, and I have to. Uh, I worked on it with a friend of mine. It's basically so much of my life story. It's not a music business book. Yeah. It's a book that would go more into the self-help shelf than the music business. Right. Because my greatest joy comes out of you know helping others. And watching others flourish right i don't get upset when you know uh, it's my wish that you should do phenomenally well sure i get that and everyone else i know should do phenomenally well yeah sure why not i, I what i said why not <laughs> yeah well, you know and my attitude is very simple you know i don't you know have the need to be the big the biggest deal in the world i never did you know i guess if i wanted to be a big a real big deal i would have become one but, uh, you know, it is funny. So many wonderful things happened to me in spite of it. Right. I got the recognition that I didn't, uh, you know, necessarily run after, you know, and all this other good stuff. I mean, it's been amazing, you know, and I learned from it all that uh, you don't have to seek it to receive it. Right. You know, I, uh, I got into the Personal Managers Hall of Fame two years ago. In a million years, I would have never thought that would have happened. I wasn't the biggest of managers. I didn't represent God knows who. Sure. You know, I uh, Billboard did a special on me. Uh, Is that online? Ago. No, it's. Uh, I got a copy of it here. I'll show you some stuff after. You should That's cool. But, uh, uh, you know, I would have never thought any of this stuff would happen. You know, I got honored at the UN in 2003 for you know, uh, for my work with the the managers forum. Wow, that thing was really a. <clears throat> but look at the things that happened: testifying in Congress, right? Starting an organization that's now 27 years old, right? Still going, and I've turned it over. I'm just in the transition period now. We had elections and. There's a whole new management board. I'm still in it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the treasurer for this year. But, uh, you know, there's been a transition going on, and it's going to, you know, I think it's in great hands. You know, this young lady, uh, Nita Ragawansi, is now the president and heads it up. And she's doing a phenomenal job. She's amazing. And, uh, you know, there's been so many wonderful things that have happened. You know, and I... You know, never asked for them. You know, all I ask for is, you know, uh, to go to sleep at night and give me one more day. <laughs> I hear you, man. You know? I'm going to ask you one. Can I ask you one more question, Barry? You can ask me two. No, I asked one. Uh, and I thank you for everything, man. You're a lovely guy. I'm really happy to thank talk you. with you. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years. And how much of that has been intentional and versus organically just from passage of time aging? That's a rough one to answer. Biggest <laughs> change in my personality. I'm going to have to say I don't really know. I would have to ask people. I would have to ask friends of mine. All right. They think the biggest change in my personality is. I... Uh, 
I honestly, that's a rough one. No, that probably means that it, whatever changes have taken place have been organically through aging and nothing deliberate because it was deliberate. You'd know. Yeah. Well, I don't think this. Well, I mean, there's been a professional change. <coughs> I wound down my business. Right. Decided to do these seminars and do consulting work. And, uh, you know, Let, let's talk but, about that. Cause I'll, this, we're talking to a bunch of musicians and you might be able to help them talk about your I, seminars I, I and consulting. Well, my seminars, and I had one last night that was uh, really successful. Uh, I decided three, uh, three and a half years ago that I was going to wind down my management and music publishing business and whatnot. And uh, I always wanted to teach because I'm, I think I'm a born teacher. You know, that's, I've always seen myself as a born teacher. And I have all of this experience, like 50 years of experience. And uh, I've seen this business from the beginnings of rock and roll to, to today. And there's so many things that I did over the years that nobody did. And I didn't care what people thought. I did them. And uh, I put together this course that I'm teaching. It's, a, it's this seminar that runs about four hours, three to four hours. And I talk about my life and lessons learned. And I talk about, uh, you know, uh, I focus on music publishing, marketing, promotion, and management. Who, who's the ideal attendee? You know, I started this, 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 this seminar three years ago, and I was doing it in person. And my intention only was to do 10 to, have 10 to 12 people at a time. Right. Whenever I would do one. Because, and why did I only want 10 to 12 people? Because I've never been motivated by getting wealthy. I've been motivated by uh, helping the next one and getting results and watching them flourish. And I wanted to give people the time uh, that they deserve. Sure. You know? So I, uh, I decided to limit it to like a dozen people. You know, if I, you know, if, if I had a big sellout or something, maybe another one or two at the most. But uh, I thought this uh, seminar would be great for 20-year-olds. I thought for young people coming up in, the, in, the band, in a band or an artist or something. And I realized I was totally wrong. I've had people from 20 to 65 come to the seminar. Now it's online. I do it on Zoom. Right. And I still limit it to 10 to 12 people. Okay, that's cool. So, and I also thought it was going to be local. New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, you know, at the time. You know, because up until uh, COVID began, uh, it was in person. Sure. I was doing it right here. You know, put the chairs around and have them in here and it would be great. And... It's amazing. I had people here from Austria, Italy, the UK. They're coming from all over. That's awesome. People from Canada, people from uh, all the states. People, you know, and I still, it's still hard for me to comprehend how people were coming to New York, going to have to fly here, hotel rooms, food and everything and they're coming to to see me and hear me speak that was amazing to me it was overwhelming and invariably i have not had one complaint that's awesome the things that i teach people get a lot out of you know and i things that i've done over the years that people don't even think about and how and it and it's all relevant. A lot, everything that I'm teaching is relevant to today. Right, right. I'm not yeah. teaching. Uh, I may tell stories of the past. Yeah, but but, uh, yeah. but, I, but everything I'm teaching is relevant to today. I talk about social media. 
I talk about, uh, you know, some stuff that happened with the press. And, uh, you know, and I, like I focus on monetizing music. And also, you know, uh, being proactive and being in a DIY world that we're in. You know, like I'll give you one little example. I'll give you a little preview of something I tell people. Yeah. I tell them the following. I say, if you're going to showcase an act, if you if you're having a you know important people come uh, to uh, to see a performance or to come and listen to uh, music or something, I had a policy. I picked the people up and took them. You didn't let them get there themselves. Yes. And I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. Because this way they couldn't leave. <laughs> ah, yeah, man. That's smart. This way I had a captive audience. Yes. They couldn't sneak out. Right, right, right. And I'm going to say something else, and I talk about it in my seminar. That philosophy is what broke the meatloaf album. And I explain it and, and I prove it also. Oh, that's cool, man. That philosophy is what broke the meatloaf album. And I prove it. I have proof. So this is the kind of stuff that I teach. And where can people, if they go to barrybergman.com? Yes. Okay. Uh, if anybody is interested, and I hope a lot of people uh, listening today are interested to come to this, because I think they'll learn a lot because that's my, uh, you know, my contribution to the world here. Uh, so I think they'll learn a lot about the business and also a few things about life. So uh, I think that uh, if anybody wants to uh, come to a seminar, uh, they should, uh, you know, I don't have an, a date yet. I did one last night, which was great. Uh, I also have a guest speaker at the seminar. Oh, that's cool. I have a young attorney, and he talks about the protection of copyrights, brands, and trademarks, and the different, uh, you know, licenses and contracts, and uh, he answers everyone's questions. That's great. Like, like free legal advice. Yeah. And I answer everyone's questions along the way in the course of the evening. And it's convenient. It's on Zoom, man. You don't have to leave your house. <laughs> That's true. And I, uh, you know, talk about, uh, like I say, you know, one of the big things I'm talking about lately is social media. Right. And how to monetize it. You know, everybody's got big numbers. You know, people have thousands of friends. Yeah, but you can't, you know, can't buy groceries with that, man. Thousands of followers. I know. It's thousands a... of this and thousands of that. I, I teach them what to do with it. Now. Right, right. And how to turn it into something. Sure. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, I would appreciate if anyone's interested that they, uh, you know, go to my website and contact me, uh, uh, send me an email through the website. And it's Barry Bergman, B-E-R-G-M-A-N.com. It's B-A-R-R-Y-B-E-R-G-M-A-N, BarryBergman.com. Yeah, and there's a contact form on there. Yeah, there's a contact page and where you can send an email. Right on. And I would appreciate it if uh, you'd mention you uh, heard me on the show on Everyone Loves Guitar. Um, listen, is there anything else I could promote for you or support that you got going on? Well, no, the only, only other thing is I do uh, consulting work. What kind? One-on-one -on -one consulting, you know, in the industry. Okay. The and, uh, you know, I, uh, you is know, that geared primarily to managers or, or who's that no, geared I, to? I don't even care what anyone does for a living. You know, uh, I'm, uh, open to, uh, consult them. So if you think you got something, depending on what their needs are. Yeah, sure. If you think you have an issue that Barry could help you with, go to his website again and contact him let him know what you got going on and uh you know, get a dialogue going a lot of people you know will say to me you know they you know they'll say oh you probably know the whole world you've been around forever you know the whole world <laughs> and my answer is very simple not true <laughs> and why because 
most of the people I know are either were either fired or retired now. Right. Or expired. Yeah. Fired, retired, or expired. <laughs> uh, man, thank you so much for everything. I really appreciate your time. You're thank a you. sweet guy, man. Yeah, this was great. I learned a lot. And uh, hang on one second. We'll get to connect. And thank you again, man. I really appreciate it. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels with your friends. Uh, I would encourage everybody to go to Barry's website, barrybergman.com. Again, it's Barry, B-E-R-G-M-A-N.com. Uh, are you on social media? Do you have pages or stuff there that you want to uh, con- connect? I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. There you go. Uh, follow him. Me contact me through the website. Yeah. Go to his website and, and reach out to him. And uh, if you want information on his seminars and also if you're interested in some consulting, just give him a dialogue so that you could, he could make a determination of what he could help you with and let him know what you're looking for. And uh, most important, especially nowadays, man, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play a guitar or whatever it is you do and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Barry, thank you so much for everything. Thank you.